It's great to hear some testimonies, isn't it, and some stories. And we each have a story to share. We each have a testimony. Um, Today we're reaching the end of the wee mini-series that we've been doing, looking at some of these big questions of life um, that are explored further as part of the Alpha course. And this morning we're going to think about the question of, well, what does it all mean? And to answer that question, we need to briefly circle back to the other couple of questions that we have uh, looked at. So Ian kicked us off with the question of, Who is Jesus? And then last week, if you were here, uh, Julian helped us think about why did Jesus die? And the answer to the question of what does this all mean very much depends on the answers that we give to those other two questions. So Ian rightly stated that you'd be hard-pressed to find a serious historian who's not going to agree that 2,000 years ago or so, There was a Jewish rabbi called Jesus who lived in Roman Palestine, was crucified because he was seen as trouble, an insurrectionist threat to the Roman authorities and a threat to the religious power of the temple leaders in Jerusalem. But if this is all the answer to the question of who is Jesus, then why did he die? Then the answer to our question, what does this mean, is, well, it doesn't mean a whole load. Perhaps at most it means that the lesson that we learn is that the powerful always win. Those in the margins will continue to be oppressed and may even be killed for what they hold dear and for their vision of a better world. But in the words of a comedian of a certain vintage, there's more. Ian and Julian's answers didn't stop with what history can tell us. In line with what Christians have answered or how Christians have answered these questions for the past 2,000 years, Ian and Julian claimed something unique about Jesus, that he was fully God and fully human, that he died to save us and that he was resurrected. Now, Their sermons were 20-something minutes long, not two minutes long. So there's a bit more to it than that. Indeed, the answers, I think, to all three of these questions are multifaceted. They're like a stained glass window that gives a beautiful picture, but is made up of many small panes of detail. And that means that it's actually hard to summarize what this all means. It's such a glorious life-changing message. It needs something strong to carry. It needs a story to carry it. And that's why it's nice that we've heard a couple of stories. But despite saying that, early in the life of the church, they gave it their best go to create a summary of, of who is Jesus, why did he die, and what does this mean? And these summaries we call the creeds of the church. None are perfect. Some are more helpful than others. One of the earliest creeds is the Nicaea Creed of uh, 325. And it gives, a, I think, a good summary of what Ian and Julian shared with us. Here's what it says about who Jesus is and why he died. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God Eternally begotten of the Father, God of God, light of light, true God from true God. If it makes you feel Christmassy, it's because we sing this at Christmas time. Begotten, not made of the one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made for us men and women. And for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. Amen. Now, my plan's not to unpack the creed. That would take more than one sermon. That would take a series. 
highlight it simply as a good summary of those two big questions of who is Jesus and why did he die? And if this is the answer to who Jesus is, if Jesus is the eternally begotten Son of the Father who came down from heaven, what an amazing thought for our salvation, who was born of Mary, who suffered and died and was crucified under Pontius Pilate, rose again on the third day and is now ascended to the Father then our question, what does this mean, is actually the question of how then should I live? What should I do? And we find the answer to this question not in propositional truths, but in the person of Jesus, in the stories we have of him and the stories which he told. Scottish-born philosopher Alistair MacIntyre, who went on his own journey from militant atheism to of being a follower of Jesus, notes, I can only answer the question, what am I to do? If I can answer the prior question, of what story or stories defined myself part? And the good news for us is we don't need to make up our own story. We are being invited to be part of the greatest story ever told. The story of God's working in the world to save and heal and make all things new. That's the story that you're invited to be part of. If you watch the new Indiana Jones movie, in the final scene you see two cyclists. And one of those is my middle son, Alistair. And he keeps getting these invites to be part of different stories. He can't take them up because he's busy doing other things. And he finds that exciting, but how much more exciting is it that we have been invited to be part of God's story? Tom Wright, one of the perhaps most prominent theologians alive today, suggests that our stories connect with the story that we find in Scripture, not by us trying to repeat it. I mean, we can't. We're not time travelers. But us living out the plot line that we find in the story of Scripture. So we're going to turn to the Bible now, and we're going to pick up some plot lines and see how they should shape and inform our lives. So if you've got your Bible with me, uh, with you, turn to Luke 19. It will also be on the screen, so don't worry if you don't have a Bible with you. And we're going to read verses 1 to 10. He entered Jericho, that's Jesus, and was passing through it, a man there was named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. The word's ruler. So he's a ruler. This is falling on from chapter 19 where we have the rich young ruler. And here we meet another ruler. But he's a tax collector. He was a ruling tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead of them and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he's gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, Half my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek out and to save the lost. Amen. Now, um, Abryologists, abryologists, people who study trees, tell us that there's probably about 73,000 species of trees in the world. But there's actually only two kinds of trees. Climbing trees and non-climbing trees. And Zacchaeus knew this truth. And on the day he climbed the sycamore tree, he discovered an even greater truth. Jesus had been looking for him before he even ever thought of trying to see Jesus. 
And that's a big truth, because the truth is Jesus has been looking for you, waiting for the opportunity to say to you, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So here's plot line one, which should shape all our lives. Jesus is looking for you. He sees you. He invites himself to be part of your life. He not only says to Zacchaeus, I need to stay at your house, but he says that to each one of us. And of course, by house, I'm meaning life. Paul, in writing to the church in Ephesus, uses the language of Christ dwelling in our hearts. It's the same thing. Why? Why is Jesus inviting himself to be part of your life? And fundamental to all of that is because he loves you. Because without him, we are lost. Without him, we veer down paths which either lead to destruction, our own and other people's, or just kind of like emptiness and banality. Because without him, we can't save ourselves from the powers which have enslaved us of death and of sin. For Zacchaeus to move from someone who had heard of Jesus, was curious about Jesus, to actually encountering him, he had to come down out of his tree. And that's plot line two for our stories. To encounter Jesus, we need to get out our trees. The place where we may be curious, but ultimately we are hiding. So sorry to spoil what you maybe heard in Sunday school if you went to Sunday school. But I don't think Zacchaeus primarily climbed the tree to get a view. I think Zacchaeus was hiding. That he was small in stature probably doesn't mean like me that he was short. The word that Luke uses, the context in which he tells us, suggests a couple of things that are going on about his stature rather than his physical height. New Testament scholar Joel B. Green suggests that small in stature refers to his youthfulness and how he was regarded by the community. Zacchaeus was not liked. He was despised. He was so disliked by the crowd that when he tried to get his way through, they said, oh, Zacchaeus, let's gang up and not let him through. He couldn't get to see Jesus because of the prejudices that people had against him. I suspect that fed into his own self-image and he was worried about how Jesus would perceive him. So he wanted to see Jesus, but not for Jesus to see him. So he climbs a tree to get away from the crowd and so that he can still see who this person Jesus is. wonder if we hide in trees. The trees that we can hide in can be many things. Self-reliance and money where we hide from the truth that we need Jesus by kidding ourselves on that, do you know what? Life's actually okay. I'm doing all right. Busyness and entertainment where we keep ourselves either so busy or so distracted that we don't have time to look in on the inside and see the mess that we're in. See if what's going on. Face up to the issues in our lives of envy or unforgiveness or bitterness and hopelessness. Pride and worry. I wonder whether Zacchaeus was a bit worried what people might have thought of. Oh, look, there's that Zacchaeus. He's a bit interested in Jesus. But it was another thing, another stick for them to hit him with. I mean, Zacchaeus was the last person you would have thought would have been interested in Jesus. I mean, he's called a sinner. He wasn't a religious person. He was the exact opposite of that. But he overcame his pride. He overcame his fear of what others might say to respond to Jesus' invitation. He responded to the fact that Jesus saw beyond how he saw himself and how others saw him to come into line with how Jesus saw him. Jesus said, you're a son of Abraham. I thought that it probably never crossed his mind before. In other words, Jesus saw Zacchaeus not as a thieving, greedy, swindling, wee 
choose whatever derogatory term you want. But he saw him as a child of God. And that's the truth of how God sees you and how God sees me. He sees us as his children. There are loads more trees in which we can hide. But here's another place to hide. Perhaps the best place to hide. Church. You may have heard the expression of hiding in plain sight. And if church is just something that we do, rather than somewhere that we encounter Jesus and allow his love to transform us, then it's a pretty good place to hide. Knowing Jesus as an idea is not the same as encountering him. To encounter him, you've got to come out your tree. When we encounter Jesus, he calls us not simply to like or admire him, but to give our lives to him and follow him. And this brings us to the third great plot line. Encountering Jesus means everything changes. Last week when Julian was talking about why Jesus died, he talked about a great exchange that takes place. Jesus took upon himself our sin, our death, our captivity to the powers. An exchange he gives us freedom, cleanses us from all wrongdoing, clothed us with honor and grace and adopted us as his sons. As sons of God, we're part of God's family. Now, when you see a child, you often know who its parents are because the child looks like mum and dad. And so, as sons of God, the Holy Spirit works in us so that we grow to be more like Jesus, so that we take on some kind of familial resemblance in our character and how we live. When people meet you and I, do they get a glimpse of who Father is? I was really struck by Julian's phrase that part of this great exchange is that we are clothed with honor. Now, being clothed with godly honor is a gift. It's not something that we earn. It's pure grace, but it demands a response. It begs a question, as the ones clothed with honor, with the glory of Jesus, how then should we live? How does that inform the choices that we make, the things that we do? Encountering Jesus means life is never the same because we're not just freed from something, but importantly, we're freed for something. Freed to live as children of God, which means that we're enrolled into the family business. The family business is the mission of God, his work of blessing and healing, of speaking life of extending forgiveness, showing mercy, acting justly, as we heard about earlier, introducing others to Jesus and making disciples. That's the business of our Father in which we have been enrolled into. It's personal. I change. It's systemic. The world changes. It's cosmic. The whole universe has changed. Zacchaeus encountered Jesus. He accepted his invitation to come and stay with him, and it changed his life. As I said, Zacchaeus was a ruler, just like the rich young ruler we meet in verse 18. But whereas he walked away, Zacchaeus is the answer to how can a rich person be saved? He is the camel that passes through the eye of the needle. He gave away half his possessions repaid people that he had defrauded. Radical, deep change. Change that is more than just going to church on a Sunday in a life group during the week. A couple of weeks back, we had Eddie and Chris from Open Doors. And Chris several times mentioned Matthew 13, 45 to 46, which reads, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. And finding one pearl of great worth, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. 
coming out of our tree to encounter Jesus, allowing Jesus to come and stay in our house, allowing this to transform us so that life is never the same. And one sense is free, but it costs us everything. It's our whole life that Jesus asks for. The parable of the peril of great worth is one of a series of parables about, on one hand, the cost of following Jesus, but also that Jesus, the life that he gives, our adoption into God's family is priceless. It is worth everything. A long time ago, in a galaxy far away, eh, when I still had a full head of hair, didn't have a better dress sense, um, Alison and I visited Nepal for three weeks. And if that sounds glamorous, then, um, next slide, uh, the cow standing in front of a skip with another cow in it, and then behind it there's a building, and on top of that building there's a bit that looks as though it's still being built. That's where we stayed, and you had to flush the toilet by getting a bucket and putting it in the cistern and pressing it. It was our honeymoon, and what can I say? I know how to show somebody a good time. <laughs> anyway, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that um, we went west and visited the town of Pokora. Not Pokora. Pokra. <laughs> Pokora is something to eat. There was lots of Pokora to eat. Pokra. Um, and we weren't trekking or anything like that, and we stumbled across the Baptist church on Sunday morning, and there I met a young man, relatively high caste Hindu. He was Brahmin, and if you know anything about like the caste system, that's the top. So relatively speaking, this young man had known a life of privilege. But he encountered Jesus in a dream, and from that moment left Hinduism and followed Jesus and he'd recently been baptized and as a result of his baptism his parents had disowned him his wife with their young child had left him to go and stay with his parents his employer had found out that he'd become a Christian and he had lost his job and his story was far from unique in Nepal and yet the church, certainly when we were there, was growing, growing rapidly. He'd found the peril of great worth and knew it was worth the cost. He discovered that in encountering Jesus, his story was part of a bigger story, a story of healing and freedom. Freedom from the sin that despoils and disfigures our humanity. A story of being loved by God and accepted. Of knowing that there's life now and an eternity with God to live. The story of Zacchaeus and of the first disciples in the early church not remind me of this young Nepalese man. But of someone I couldn't have met because, do you know what, he died before I was born. Like Zacchaeus and the young man, this person Look to faithfully live out the answer of how should we live if Jesus is God and he died and was, was resurrected for us. His name was Clarence Jordan. I've told his story before, so apologies if you've heard it. Clarence was born in 1912 in Georgia in the southern states of the USA and he died in 1969, a year after the racist Jim Crow laws which dehumanized and marginalized African-Americans were, in theory, abolished. He was for a while a Baptist pastor, but uh, left this in 1942 to set up a farm. And the farm that Clarence and his wife set up was known as Canonia Farm. He and his wife demonstrate, uh, established it as a demonstration plot for the kingdom of God. Now, Kenonia, one of the New Testament words I struggle to say, but in Greek we often translate it, or when we translate it from Greek into English, we often translate it as fellowship. But it's more than simply being together and enjoying a cup of tea and a sandwich. It points to life shared together in and under the kingdom of God. Mennonite theologian David Osberger states, in the Christian scriptures, 
the highest word, the most virtuous form of love is not agape, but kinonia, the mutual, reciprocal, committed, and celebrative love of intimate relationship, authentic community, and responsive fellowship. And that's what Clarence and his wife looked to establish on their farm. They went against the Jim Crow laws of Georgia, employed black workers as their equals and not merely as employees. They ate supper with them on the front porch where everybody else could see what they were doing. They treated them like members of their family because they knew the truth that in Christ they were members of their family. Now, needless to say, their activities drew the attention of a certain group called the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. Burning crosses appeared in the front lawn. Uh, people were harassed. They set up some kind of like farm shop things. They were bombed and burned. And Clarence had a brother who was a lawyer who was politically ambitious so in the 1950s, in the face of the police doing nothing, Clarence went to his brother, Bob, and said, can you help us? James McClendon Jr. records for us the conversation between the brothers, and Callum's going to help me as we uh, reenact this conversation for you. Callum's going to play Clarence, and I'm going to play Bob. So... Um, and we're not going to uh, attempt the accent. So Clarence has gone to, to, uh, to Bob and said, Bob, can you help us? And Clarence, uh, Bob says, Clarence, I can't do that. You know my political aspirations. Why, if I represent you, I might lose my job. I might lose my house. I might lose everything I've got. We might lose everything too, Bob. But it's different for you. Why is it different? I remember, it seems to me that you and I joined the church on the same Sunday as boys. And I expect when you came forward, the question the preacher asked you was the same as he asked me. He asked, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour? And I said, yes. What did you say, Bob? Well, I follow Jesus, Clarence. I follow Jesus up to a point. Could that point by any chance be the cross? That's right. I follow him. I follow him to the cross, but not on the cross. I'm not getting myself crucified. Then I don't believe you're a disciple. You're an admirer of Jesus, but you're not a disciple of his. I think you ought to go back to church you belong to and tell them I'm an admirer, not a disciple. Thanks, Callum. An admirer of Jesus can stay safe in their tree. But to be a disciple, to follow Jesus means we need to get out of our tree, whatever that tree looks like. Because as Clarence Jordan knew, Jesus bids a man pick up his cross and follow him. There's no following of Jesus without the cross. You go to the next slide, Sam, thanks. The one after that. The words of Jesus about what this means. If anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their crosses and follow me. For those who want to save their lives will lose it. And those that lose their lives for my sake will find it. Who Jesus is, that he died and rose again, means we say, take my life. Take it all. Because you have the words of eternal life. I can't save myself. And the question that I ask myself this morning, indeed many mornings, is am I just simply an admirer of Jesus? <clears throat> Looking at him safely hidden in my tree where nothing much is asked of me. 
Or am I faithfully walking the path of following him? Even if that means the cost of the cross. We can only follow, we can only walk in the way of the cross because we encounter Jesus who is God incarnate. Because we encounter Jesus, the resurrected one, who is alive forevermore. If death has been defeated, which is what we claim has happened, what we will celebrate in Easter, then what is there left for us to fear? Our encountering Jesus means we respond by surrendering all to him because we hear his call to walk with him. I mean, let that sink in. You are invited to walk with God. We hear the call of Jesus and respond in faithful allegiance, crowning him as King and Lord of our lives in the sure and certain hope That just as God raised Jesus from the dead, so at the end of this age, he'll resurrect our frail and broken bodies and make us fit for life with him in new creation. In this sure and certain hope we know now, in the present, God's presence with us as a foretaste, as a guarantee of life with him of our ultimate resurrection. And so to quote the Apostle Paul from Romans 8, and with this I'll end and Richard will come back and lead us in some worship. If God is for us, who is against us? For he did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for us. Will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor heights nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.